morning. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the Heads Consortium, I would like to welcome to you our 2020 Best Practice Showcase, celebrating technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Karen Rivera, and I will be in charge of, of introducing the speaker of the rating section of this room. Also, we have time for questions at the end. The presenter will let you know whether you will be able to address your question at any time during the presentation. This presentation will be in English. We will appreciate that you change your mobile phone to vibration or silent mode in order to have your full attention to this session. Finally, please make sure you complete the evaluation form for this session and hand it in before you leave this room. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to HEX. Now, we are going to start. The title of this presentation <coughs> is Beta. Mm -hmm. Believing everyone can achieve creating access for Hispanic Latino joy. Thank you so much. <laughs> and the name of the speaker, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, is Miss Dulce Maldonado Munoz. Yes. Thank you so much for the Thank introduction you. there. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I do realize I'm right before lunch, uh, so I'll promise to keep this fairly brief. Uh, but what really I will talk about a lot of what I have for my track is access, as you can see, is really getting uh, Hispanic Latino students into higher education. So with that, uh, I'll do a Brief glance. I'm going to turn it on. I apologize. Oh, I just did you turn it on? I did. I don't think it's working. But no, I'm sorry. But okay. So at a glance, I'll do a little bit about what we've been doing with Southeast Missouri State University. As the introduction that we have, my name is Luisa Maldonado Munoz. So I come on behalf of that institution. It is my alma mater. I did my undergraduate there, and I'm still a student there. I'm currently doing my master's program in public administration. So a lot of it, I come more so on the student side of the culture. Uh, a little bit about myself, I'm originally from Mexico City. So within that, I'm a native speaker with Spanish. I lived there until uh, when I was nine years old. And then of course, as you can imagine, with a lot of our population, uh, work challenges kind of forced us to come to the US. And of course, they made Missouri as our home, away from home, so to speak. Uh, so I'll be talking about a little bit about the popul population competency. I come with a lot of that background with the culture. I'll also highlight a little bit of how my job and my role as a multicultural recruitment counselor ties in into focusing the outreach for the institution within that. And of course, looking ahead, what initiatives our university has taken really to go beyond me getting them into an institution and having them be successful here at Southeast Missouri State University. So within that, if you're not really familiar with Southeast, I forgot to kind of include an introduction slide of that. Southeast Missouri State University is located on the southeast region of uh, Missouri. It's two hours south of St. Louis, kind of give you like a, a geographical location within that. Uh, we are a public <coughs> institution. Uh, we are kind of mid-sized, not too big or small, as I always tell my students. Uh, we're around 11,000 students, uh, 10,000 undergraduate, about 1,000 uh, uh, master's program within that. And of course, we offer more than 200 areas of study. So we have anything from the STEM area. We do have a College of STEM, a Harrison College of Business. But right now, what we really pride ourselves in that we have really going for us is we have a full campus dedicated to theater, dance, and music. So visual performing arts, we consider the only ones who are conservatory. So, uh, that's a little bit of the background of the university within that. Uh, apologies, I did not include a slide for that, but that's what we have. So when I talk about with population competency, a lot of things come to mind. I think throughout my uh, whole uh, conference here at the at HETS, uh, we've been touching on this, that there's a lot of factors that go involved into this. Uh, when I'm coming at it with this angle with population competence, especially for the Hispanic Latino community, there's a lot of things that come to mind. But even on my own personal experience that I had as a student, a lot of these students, uh, even getting into college, because I am on the kind of recruitment side, believing that we can go into college, kind of eludes us. Uh, I know when I was in my 
senior year in high school, uh, it didn't come into my mind that college might be a possibility because it's when you have that tough talk with your family about your legal status, I did not know I was undocumented. Uh, I graduated back in 2014 and when I started applying to colleges, it really became kind of a struggle of figuring out what I could and couldn't do. Uh, where we're located with my institution and where I live right now in Missouri, it is considered one of those that are kind of on the borderline of being locked up or not locked up. What I mean by that is that uh, students that are undocumented like myself or our DACA, uh, we don't receive in-state tuition even regardless of however long we live. There's no student financial aid available through the state and federal government, so FAFSA again, that kind of alludes us to us. So when I talk about population competency, where I recruit from in my area for university, it's really looking at that first step of letting my students know that yes, you can do this regardless of that legal status. So kind of empowering them. So I already mentioned about the, uh, the population we think that what I deal with is a lot with the documented <coughs> versus undocumented. So that's kind of my area of expertise. So 2014, senior year so trying to figure out college, that was me. Uh, we went through a lot of political kind of change within that. I know that was during the Obama era that he came with the policy called the the Fur Action of Chocolate Arrivals. This became kind of implementation back in 2012. It had a standard criteria of how to apply, who could apply for this and get that access. Again, by any means, this kind of what came about was not a permanent fix. It was kind of like a band-aid on a gaping wound. So when I was uh, in high school as a senior, this kind of helped me out a lot. First and foremost, it helped me, one, get a working permit that comes with that uh, DACA status. The other thing, it also allows you to apply for a social security number that you can get. And then just the common everyday kind of thing, it allowed me to go get a driver's license. So very important to, to come and go work. That's very important in what we do. So, But just so that we're clear within this, again, I mentioned it's not a permanent fix. It is, there's no pathway into citizenship for us that are documented in that area. So really, right now, we're going through a lot of political change within and trying to figure out. So even DACA itself, right now, is being on the question of whether it is. But I do like to establish, again, when talking to everyone, how do we proceed with the students? We're still undocumented. So there's no paperwork whatsoever. So a lot of people get those confused. And then I did include that map that you see up there from the, uh, from the US data that we have from the census. It kind of just shows the breakdown of, again, the states that do provide that financial aid for those students and the ones that, that are kind of somewhat and then the ones that are locked out. There are a handful that are locked out, uh, the ones that are predominantly kind of, uh, kind of more in the East Coast area. But as you can see, where there's a heavy population of a lot of Hispanic students, they fall more in the Southwest. So you can see they do offer that institution. But such was my luck that I'm in Missouri. As you can see, there's not much that we have going in our state. Uh, so it's trying to look at an approach since I was hired into the university coming off of that how do we help these students? So within my background, my last year of undergraduate, uh, I did like an internship with the university. So really looking at what we can help to do those students, especially in the area that we're in, to help and get those students into college and making them successful. So right now I'm really on the focus of getting them into the university and giving them that resource. So that's just like a bit brief breakdown of what the two populations that I'm dealing with, and it's very important <coughs> because legal status is very at the forefront when we're applying to college, is the first thing that we're kind of thinking about in our area. So within that focus and outreach, it's very important with the students, it's not like you can come up to someone, well, what legal status are you, right? It's kind of uncomfortable kind of question. I have that myself as a student. It's not something that I took very lightly because again, uh, we had a session yesterday where we were talking about the family unit. Again, my parents also don't have any paperwork. So when we're dealing with that one student, you're also dealing with the family side. So focus and an average how I kind of approached it. There's a, a lot of elements that I kind of use within that. Of course, as we think the first thing is course of language. So as an undergraduate, took the internship, the first thing on my project and agenda is build a Spanish website. So that was my first project that I had, taking what we already had our institution and building that from the ground up. Uh, that was back in 2017. Uh, that's when we got that going. I partnered with the Marking University to get that going. And then really figuring out what families really needed to know to understand college. And most of them, they were like me, 
We are first generation, meaning that no one in our family has gone to college before. So even for a traditional domestic student, it's already challenging that college process. Imagine for someone that's one, an immigrant, minority, has no paperwork, and also has to apply to colleges within that process. So kind of that cultural competency again kind of ties in on what parents need to know. It's kind of like a teacher move moment for everyone, including the student themselves, to figure that out. And of course, as I progressed through my internship, uh, that got implemented in 2017, I got hired in 2018, and from then I really took it a step further. Uh, we really focused on publications going out to students. Uh, the first one that you can see, newsletters, I send those in a bi-weekly basis right now. Uh, they are bilingual, so because I understand, depending on the student, they might be more comfortable in English as I am today presenting than I am in my Espanol. So depending on what the student chooses, depending on what they associate, I give them the option that they can have either one. And of course, their family, they really need to communicate that, communicate that since that's a unit. They need to see that up front also too. So newsletters are very important for me. I do mail mergers that I send. It can be either an email or it can also be kind of a printout that can be sent. And that gets me to the publication. So when I travel, uh, I have Kansas City, Chicago, kind of like my predominantly heavy areas for Hispanics. I travel with pieces, again, that have that Spanish and highlight to connect with those students. Or even I will get uh, parents at college first because they're really involved in this whole process of getting them to go to college. So even print out things that students can have physically have and give that to their parents. And of course, we are going more, of course, in technology or involvement. I mentioned the website. That's a very factor that I do promote to a lot of a resource for my students and family. But of course, getting out there, the outreach with the promotional video piece. So a lot of those, uh, I know Dr. Vargas, he's our president of our institution. So he's kind of like the role model and the kind of setting the pathway that, hey, you can do this. So we've got a few videos with him talking both to students or then addressing parents. And then we also have about talking about our classroom space, opportunities they have at the university, and of course those are offered in both English and Spanish. So usually I tag those videos or anything like in an email I'm sending out so they can see kind of from what they have to offer at the institution. So targeted visits and college fairs. So as an undergraduate uh, in my internship, kind of a lot of my work overlaps because it kept building on as I progressed. But it's first started a lot with a lot of targeted uh, re uh, reaching to the population. But since I got hired almost two years ago, my have focused on how to actually get into the in front of the student, especially the Hispanic student that can relate to myself. So going into the office, kind of the technology that I use kind of within that, I used a lot of the department education reports that they pull from the data. So that's self-reported data from the high school. So I don't know if you're aware of that, but they show what enrollment they have by ethnicity, uh, uh, background, gender, age. So they do a full breakdown. Of course, my focus was Hispanic, Latino that were in high school, that grade level of junior and senior year. So those are my main, main things that I pull from. And so from there, I really contacted the high schools since the sales report gives you kind of a point of contact with people, and then they just broke it down to connect it to the guidance counselor to schedule those visits and get those going for, the, for those students. The other thing I kind of did, and you kind of see it mentioned there, I kind of did that as a student because I really didn't know what I was doing when I was an undergraduate when they told me, well, help us recruit more Hispanic Latinos institution. I took the approach um, from Mexico City, so within that we're predominantly Catholic in, in Mexico, so I was grown up as a Catholic, so I took the approach because back home in Missouri, even home in Missouri, uh, we have a parish that has both bilingual masses. So I uh, took the approach of looking at churches that offer bilingual masses. So if you had a Spanish mass, I was going to go reach out to that community, to that parish, and then coordinate a workshop so I could really talk to everyone as a whole. So I would talk to no, not only the student, but the family, the uncle, the aunt, whoever the case might be that was there. I made those points of contact. So I really targeted first region, geographical wise. So Southeast region, I went there. Uh, lately though, I've branched out to even the St. Louis area to find parishes that may have that so that I could talk to those families and students for that. Um, the other thing that we're kind of working right now and we're building, and I even did as a student, we're attending those National Hispanic College Fairs that are predominantly serving. So again, uh, kind of getting that focus outreach to students to be up there in front of them. Uh, I do those fairs and typically I could even notice students having like those language kind of barriers. 
So I provide for them dependently. They're more comfortable with their English or Spanish. I think our uh, institution has really taken to me to be that resource for students so I can make them feel comfortable and relating to us and relating that information to them. So those fairs are really important. We do get a lot of uh, leads from our students to go and reach out. And the biggest thing with all those visits and the engagement that I just t touched on, the biggest thing that I've learned even now as a first generation kind of professional going into the workforce, we do rely heavily on that customer relations management, that CRM. So what I've learned with all my visits, I'm able to track the attendance of students, how many come and talk to me. I'm able to pull reports from that customer uh, relations management. So one, not only I can uh, find how many the number, but then I can follow up with them. So I could, I personally hand write uh, handwritten notes to be sent out, or I might send, send them a quick email depending on the time constraints that I have. But just making that touch of knowing that, hey, I'm here for you, I can help you. We talked about it, that family. I really want them to get the sense that they already have someone at our institution with myself that can lead them through that process. Because I didn't have anyone at the time in high school. My high school counselor, I think I remember when I approached her during senior year, she's like, you know what, I'll be honest with you. I don't think I had any student that did not have a citizenship. So. I'm sorry to say I can't help you in that regard. And so that, to me that was very distressing. And as you can imagine, a lot of students are facing a lot of these, especially where we're located in the Midwest. So I'm um, kind of become kind of support for those students. In doing that, really the customer relations management is really my useful tool of technology that I pull those lists for those students. So mentioned community workshops. Kind of already talked about the uh, parishes and the churches. But the other thing that you see here on this picture, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was also the president of the Association of Latinos. So some of the things that we kind of been involved in, we did a lot of engagement with the community in Cape Girardeau, where we're located at. Uh, so some of the things during Hispanic Heritage Month, we host community events, community workshops. So inviting the community to one, celebrate our culture, but two, I do it a two-way. If they want to learn about how the university can help them better their lives, that's something that I provide for them. Again, it builds leads into the family and students. So the biggest event that you see here is called uh, Tacos at Twilight. It's become very popular. We bring taco trucks either at park or right now we're kind of uh, figuring out more of a logistic for the coming years of how to better improve it. Uh, the idea now that we have going is that we've seen a great turnout of, of people showing up for this event, turn it into a fundraiser. So, <coughs> getting money from the people that come and do it, because previously it was all free, so you could all eat all the tacos that you wanted, so it was kind of nice. But now we're trying to figure out how we can use that, uh, that attendance to kind of leverage to build scholarship and donations for these students. So, because I did mention Missouri, it is a state that we don't have much financial aid going for us. So again, trying to figure out the means that we can support the students financially coming in your institution. So, very important to get that in. So looking beyond getting them there. So I do focus a lot in getting them at our institution, but of course talking to a lot of the conferences that I've, well not the conferences that I've been, but the sessions I've been here for this conference have really been talking about the retention within that. Some of it already I'm trying to figure out how to implement, which is great, it's given me a lot of ideas. But some of the things and initiatives we, we're doing at the university currently is that we're trying to foster that student engagement. I mentioned that CRM builds and pulls all reports so I kind of tell counsel to the students. So even while they're here uh, at the institution, I still get every once in a while a text because I texted all the students when they were leads. I hand texted them, each every one of them, letting them know that I was there. If they needed just a quick text or saying, hey, good luck on this. I still do that with the kind of pulling the reports for those students to get those going. And of course, right now I am charged with being uh, leading a Hispanic uh, Learning Task Force for the university. So I'm co-chairing 11 staff and faculty to figure out pathways on what we can do at this institution to build, again, that cultural competency for the students to know one, get them at the university, but also be, have them be successful across the board within that. So I will be in charge also within that uh, kind of interview for student ambassadors. I'll be hiring this semester, kind of build kind of like that me uh, mentor program, more so that they can reach out and relate to the students when I do these events. I have someone that has a current kind of experience of student, uh, so they can relate to them. And of course, teaching students to self-advocate and build that professionalism. So that is the goal that we're building right now at this institution, is to get make those students successful and be retainable here at, at, at the university. 
So within that, accessibility or support, uh, we talked again about familia, very, very important. So we want them that, for them to feel connected to your university, that they have a family here at an institution. So one of the biggest things when even I'm talking to them at a college or a high school visit, I mentioned student organization of Latinos. That is a peer-to-peer, -peer current students they kind of relate to. Uh, again, it kind of fosters that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mentorship that they can relate to, but it also helps them relate to others, share their experiences, share their culture with the campus, and let them know that they're not alone. Uh, that was the biggest thing when I was an undergraduate at Southeast is that once I did find this group, I was like, oh, there are others like myself, and we would share stories of our upbringing of having like a two bilateral cultural kind of clash that we had, because of course, in school, you get all the English component, more in American, and going home, it's all in Spanish. So it's kind of figure out those things. And of course, being involved on campus. So we are really resourced and trying to be engaged. Uh, we do a lot of cultural events at our institution, so sharing that to the community and letting them know that, yes, we're here, and more than happy to share that with other people. So again, that sort of becomes like the first step of having a family unit at our institution that I really, really, really do promote for students. But of course, within that, uh, we also want to create support across the board, as we've been hearing in the sessions. Financial aid, again, uh, continues to be a prevailing thing that a lot of students see this to be successful and complete their career. So some of the things that we've been working with the Hispanic Learning uh, Task Force is that we're working with the University Foundation of our alumni that have given back the money uh, to figure out how to build a scholarship called the Beca Scholarship, which is kind of in my title, Believe in Everyone Can Achieve Within That, is that we're hoping that with this scholarship alumni current that might be interested in helping this population will ever give back and give those funds for those students. So it has, has some criteria within that as far as applying, but of course the biggest thing I tell my students when I'm talking to them, it's regardless of your legal status and you, you can apply for that. So again, this is a very, very interesting initiative that I want to see it through, uh, get the uh, accessibility for students to get that going for them. Uh, again, we're trying to create those pathways so they're successful, and I realize even from my own personal experience, that financial pay piece is very important for them to be able to be successful at any institution. So, with that, I think I talked fast. <laughs> I really did talk very, very fast. Uh, does anyone have any questions, comments, suggestions, things? Because I, I will say within the initiatives that I've been working a lot with my institution, they are kind of in the preliminary basis, I'm building it from the ground up. I come more with the cultural side as far as what I experienced firsthand to relate to the students. Right now I'm in the process of getting the actual data kind of component of actually having more of a structure of a guideline for that. But 